I have a tendency to speak too fast, and that annoys people who are native English speakers, and is probably exceptionally annoying to non-native English speakers, so I will try to talk slower. And if I talk too fast, you can wave at me, maybe just with one finger, and tell me to slow down. <laughs> um, yeah, and so, uh, yeah, thank you, Seba. Uh, today, I want to talk about some tools that we've been developing uh, and, and talk about how you can use source code and some of the technologies that we've been developing um, along with OWASP, Zap, and potentially other tools to get benefits when you're doing web application penetration tests or web application assessments. Um, so agenda-wise, I'll talk just a little bit about my background, I'll talk about why there's value in using source code when you're doing application assessments. And then I'm gonna talk about this technology we've developed called hybrid analysis mapping that we've developed in conjunction or, or funded by the United States Department of Homeland Security. Uh, and then I'm gonna show an example of the tools that we've developed and released for this. Uh, and we'll look at how it can be used to do three different things. You know, the first is to do uh, attack surface enumeration. So in using the source code of, an, of a web application to highlight all of the potential attack points in the application. Uh, use it also potentially to identify, identify backdoors that have been intentionally added to applications. And then also talk about how it can be used to identify potential configuration problems with certain web frameworks. Uh, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Uh, or if you have a question along the way, please feel free to uh, just raise your hand and I'll uh, do my best to answer them. That's a picture of me. Um, just a, a little bit about my background. I'm a software developer by background, originally in the mid to late 1990s, doing a lot of work with early server-side Java stuff, uh, then in the early 2000s doing a lot of uh, early ASP.NET work. But really what I've spent the majority of my time in the last probably 10 years of my career is looking at how software developers and the software that they build impacts the security of organizations. And so. I have a, a background as a software developer who has come into the security space instead of being someone from a more traditional penetration testing or you know, network security background that has come into security. And that colors my uh, views on the, on the matter a little bit. So you know, why use source code? And that's an interesting thing. That's a, a conversation that we have in interacting with organizations from time to time where they say, if you're pen testers are so clever, why do you want access to source code, right? If you're, are your people not smart enough? We get this a lot with mobile application assessments of, you know, if your testers are so good, why do we also have to give you the source code? And, you know, the, the answer really comes down to a question of goals. If you're doing testing of an application, in certain cases, it makes sense to attack from a blind standpoint. You know, we've used that approach in the past where uh, certain security executives want to make a point. You know, where they want to be able to go to their executives and say, here's the very limited set of information that we gave these people, and here's what they were able to do. And so from a politics standpoint, occasionally there's value in being able to say, when given nothing, these testers were able to find so much stuff. But the more, much more common or more frequent occurrence is that the purpose of testing is to learn more about the security state of the application. And so what you really want is the most amount of security insight for whatever budget you have. So you know, every or everyone here presumably works in an organization where you have some sort of a budget, either of dollars or, you know, or euros or uh, you know, manpower, right? Does anyone here work in an organization where you have no budget, unlimited budget? Are, are, you, are those organizations hiring? Because that would be a fun job. <laughs> Right? But most organizations, you have some sort of limitations. It's a, either a, a monetary amount, if you're going to outside testers, it's the time for your internal testers. And so really, if you want to get the maximum amount of security insight for that investment, it makes a lot of sense to provide source code to the testers because there are often things that are easier to test from static analysis, uh, you know, reading source code or doing static analysis in an automated way, uh, versus testing a live system. And so, you know, that's really, uh, you know, we, we encounter, as I said, a number of arguments, uh, you know, aren't your testers smart enough? Like, my, my testers would love to spend time reverse engineering your iPhone binary, right, or decompiling your Android binary or doing whatever, but the question is, do you, is that where your 
time or your investment is best made, right? And so, uh, you know, really it's a question of goals and if you wanna have the maximum amount of security insight, uh, it typically makes sense to do, or to provide both source code as well as a running application so that you can switch between statically testing or looking at source code uh, and dynamically testing, looking at a running application. And so what I'm gonna talk about is uh, some technologies that we've developed and how we've been able to use those to increase the quality of the uh, application penetration testing that we're doing um, <clears throat> while keeping the time low and also how we're able to increase the, uh, the, the thoroughness of the testing that we're doing. Uh, and again, everything that I'm talking about here, you can download off of GitHub and I've got, you know, the slides will obviously posted and I've got links to, to downloads and whatnot. Um, so this is something where if this is something you're interested in, this is obviously something that you can do. Uh, we have a plugin for Zap as well as for Burp and we're working on other plugins. Um, and uh, you know, again, love to hear feedback from folks if they, uh, you know, if they find these techniques useful. The technology that we're going to be talking about is called hybrid analysis mapping. And it's, uh, the original goal of this was, how do we merge the results of static testing and dynamic testing? So if I have a set of static testing results from a tool like a Fortify or a Checkmarks, and if I have a set of dynamic testing results from a tool like a Web Inspector, an AppScan, or a Zap, how can I stitch those together and get a unified view into the security testing results that I've found? And uh, you know, as I'll talk about, and this uh, again may be of some interest to, uh, to folks over here, uh, you know, we've worked with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. They funded a lot of this, um, uh, and, and again, we've made it available uh, you know, open source um, you know, as, a, as a part of that contract. And so um, uh, we're currently in phase two. We've been working on this research for about three years in total, and this is with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate under a SBIR grant or contract. Um, and the goal of these is to identify new technologies for United States federal customers. What are different departments in the U.S. federal government interested in and how can they provide some funding to get private firms to develop those technologies? Um, <clears throat> and uh, again, what we've uh, built is a hybrid analysis mapping. We've included it with our ThreadFix uh, community edition server side, but we've also made it available in a couple of client side tools and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I also, uh, one, one thing that probably makes sense to say is I don't speak officially for US DHS. I'm not employed by them. This is a contract where, the, where they've provided funding, um, but I don't speak officially for them. I'm speaking for, uh, for, for myself today. Um, just, uh, you know, this is not, should not be seen as an endorsement, uh, other than I guess they provided the money for it. Um, so, as I said, our initial goal with, in creating this technology was to figure out can we take, and, and the scope of our initial testing, ju just for, for clarity, was if we have results from a static test with uh, SCA, a dynamic test with AppScan, can we stitch those together and identify where there are overlapping vulnerabilities that were identified? Um, we just found in a number of organizations that we'd worked with, they deployed those two tools and just the way that the acquisitions had happened, uh, one technology ended up at HP, one technology ended up at IBM, um, but these organizations had a need to make these tools operate better together. Uh, and from that we found, you know, we were able to do this as well as to do you know, some other things that I think are interesting. And so to provide a little bit of background, I, I, is everyone here familiar with dynamic application security testing or DAST? Excellent, good. Just as a little bit of background, <clears throat> that's the testing of a running application. And so we're going to look at a running system, we're going to exercise that system and look for patterns that indicate that there may be vulnerabilities. And the typical process that you use for this is you spider the application, much like Google would spider the internet to index things. Um, you're going to crawl an application, start at the home page, look at the HTML, look at the JavaScript, you know, find links to external pages, go crawl those, and look for all the forms that can be submitted, all the parameters that can be passed in, cookies that are in use, uh, things of that nature. And obviously for testing web applications that have a login requirement, you also have to train the tool to log in and to know when it has a valid session so that you can see, you know, so you get better coverage of the application. Uh, once you've identified that attack surface of all the pages you can post to, all the parameters that can be passed in, uh, then you fuzz that, you know, send in various uh, payloads, look at the responses that come back, and, uh, and, and look for the presence of vulnerabilities. So if I submit to an application a SQL control character like a, a, a apostrophe, 
and I get back a JDBC error message, I look at that and say, that request and response pattern seems to indicate the presence of a SQL injection vulnerability. Um, and for our purposes, what a finding looks like is the vulnerability type, the relative URL or the position in the application, as well as for certain types of vulnerabilities, that injection point. So if I have a misconfiguration where I have directory indexing turned on, you know, for situations like that, I don't need an entry point, I just need to know if I go to the slash reports directory, I'm going to get a listing of all the files in the directory and that's probably not the way you want your server configured. But for a SQL injection, I need to be able to say, well, for the login.jsp page, if I pass in a username parameter, it appears that we have a reflected cross-site scripting or whatever it might be, but we need to know that parameter or that injection point. When we talk about static application security testing, that's looking at an application at rest. So looking at the source code of an application or the binary of an application, doing some analysis on that, you know, data flow analysis, control flow analysis, <clears throat> and through that analysis, looking for patterns in the code or in the binary that indicate potential presence of vulnerabilities. And so I think you can kind of see here where you know, we have any, anything passed in via a parameter under the control of an attacker, right? So we see that we get tainted data from that get parameter call. That gets assigned into the username variable, so then we can consider that username variable to be tainted. That username variable gets combined with some other text and assigned to the SQL variable. So that variable is then tainted. And that tainted variable of SQL gets passed into the sensitive function of execute. And so here we're able to start with this username parameter being passed in. We do the data flow taint analysis, find it passed to a SQL sensitive function, and in that way we've identified, here we think that this is a SQL injection vulnerability. So we've essentially found two of the same type of vulnerabilities, or potentially the same vulnerability, <clears throat> but we've used different types of analysis in order to find that. And so our original goal was, how can we take these very different types of analysis and stitch the results of those together so that I can do more testing, but have a consolidated view into those tools. And where I have overlap, that gives me really valuable information that I can use to potentially pass on to developers to say, here's the request that came in, here's the data or control flow through the application, and here's the response that came back, right? And so as a security analyst going to a developer, that makes a very, or a stronger case potentially that yes, this is a true positive vulnerability, and here's the information you need in order to remediate this more quickly. You know where the stuff is in the code, you can see the behavior, and seeing all of that data together makes it easier for a developer to go in and hopefully successfully remediate. Um, any questions about that so far? Good. So to do this, we needed to, we needed to solve three different, or make three different decisions or solve three problems. The first was to standardize on uh, you know, some sort of vulnerability naming or vulnerability taxonomy. And we ended up standardizing on the MITRE CWE, or Common Weakness Enumeration. Um, you know, each vendor has their own. The uh, uh, HPE folks or the Fortify folks have their uh, seven pernicious kingdoms. I'm a native English speaker, and I don't really use the word pernicious very often. Is anybody, yeah, so that's, um, I've, I've done training actually for non-native speakers in Fortify and always get to that you know, section of the slides. I'm like, ah, pernicious. Uh, but we, we relied on the MITRE CWE, um, which uh, is, uh, you know, has, certainly has issues, but has actually worked very well for, for our purposes. That's probably the best taxonomy out there. Uh, the joke, I think, is, you know, what's the, you know, democracy is the worst form of government except for all of the other options. Uh, the MITRE CWE is the worst vulnerability taxonomy except for all the other options. And uh, so that, that's actually proved to be, uh, you know, a, a pretty valuable um, or a good decision that we made rather than creating our own taxonomy that would just be challenging to maintain and, and, and you know, keep tracking forward over time. We also, to solve this problem, need to match static and dynamic locations. And this will become important to some of the stuff we talk about later, where I need to know when a request comes into a particular URL, what code is actually going to get stitched up to that URL. So when I take this code, compile it to a binary or whatever we do, when this code ends up in the running application, where on the application's attack surface is that code going, or you know, how can you reach out and touch and execute that code? And then we also had to determine, in cases where parameters were being passed in, how do we identify where that parameter 
enters the application. So when I know what a request looks like to a web application, I have the URL and the parameter, how do I know what code is responsible for that behavior in the application? So those are the problems that we set up to solve. Um, so given the source code, you know, which we can pull from Git or Subversion or you can pass it in directly, we detect the framework type and the language. And so we go in and look and identify, this looks like it's an application written using Java, and it appears to be using the Struts framework, or it appears to be using the Spring framework, or Ruby on Rails, or whatever it might be. And so there's a, a, a set of languages and frameworks that we support. Um, and uh, some of the static analysis tools provide some additional meta information. If that's available, we use it, but it's not required. Um, and so from this, we build what we call as an endpoint database. So by knowing what the language and the framework are, that lets us enumerate all of the URLs that that application should respond to, and as well as all the parameters or cookies or other entry points there might be to that application. And we build a database of all of those and keep track of the source code entry point that is responsible for each of those pieces of behavior. And so this is not necessarily, at this point, we're just figuring out for this application what are all the behaviors that we can potentially see and how, you know, what code is responsible for those. Uh, and it, it, you know, make, you know, with no, uh, no thinking about security at this point, we're just trying to understand how do we expect this application to behave when this source code or binary code starts to be a running application. From that, that let us do the merging of the static to the dynamic results. Because what we can do is look and say, for example, I have a dynamic result. I have a reflected cross-site scripting vulnerability in the page login .j, or in the URL login.jsp for the username parameter. That's what the dynamic scanner told us, uh, that, that, that it found a vulnerability. Then we can query the endpoint database, and that's going to say, well, this is a Java and Spring application. That particular parameter enters the application for that URL at you know, com.whatever.whatever.logincontroller.java at line 62, let's say. So then I can go and look at my set of static findings, and if I find a reflected cross-site scripting vulnerability at that particular class and for that particular entry point, I can match those up and say, I believe that this is two pieces of evidence I have about one vulnerability, as opposed to being two individual findings that need to be triaged separately. Um, <clears throat> so that's basically what we, uh, you know, how we set about solving that problem. And what we found was, uh, you know, again, from a, from a research standpoint, we feel like it produced a successful result because we're able, you know, typically to be able to identify these situations. Um, but we got to talking inside of our organization and said, what other stuff can we do? <clears throat> you know, can we do any other queries or from this data structure that we've built, are there other queries that we can do, other operations that we could perform that would potentially be valuable? And so one thing that we looked at doing was saying, what if I did you know, the SQL equivalent of a select star on that database, right? What if I said to this endpoint database, give me all of the endpoints you have in that database? <clears throat> you know, that's interesting because that tells us, again, all the URLs that that application might be, uh, you know, might be willing to respond to. Uh, what we also found, and we'll talk about this less today, but what we also found is even if we only have dynamic results, but we've built this data structure, we can map things back to entry point lines of code. So we can potentially, when we have source code and a dynamic test run with like a zap, we can say, okay, I've got this you know, reflected cross-site scripting vulnerability for this URL. We can go to the source code in the developer's IDE and put a marker. And that's not as good as you would have. Most of the static tools have really nice IDE plugins where you can go and step through the entire data and control flow. That would be better, but if you don't have static results, if you only have dynamic results, but you've also built this endpoint database, that's a transform that you can do. And so we, uh, I won't talk about that as much today, but that's one of the things that we also did is provided um, plugins for Eclipse and IntelliJ, and I think we've got one for Visual Studio now. Um, that, that you know, creates, uh, that will put markers at the entry point. Again, with the hope being, can we get developers in a position to uh, fix these lines of code more quickly than they would have otherwise? Uh, what we did, uh, and what we'll talk more about today, is created plugins for a number of different dynamic scanners so that we can take these, you know, we can take this endpoint data and use it to precede those scans. And so we've got plugins right now for OWASP Zap, we've got plugins for OWASP, or uh, for, for, for Burp, 
Uh, and we also have a plugin, although I don't think it's been released yet. Uh, it should be shortly for uh, AppScan, uh, IBM Rational AppScan. And today we'll talk about the OWASP Zap plugin just because uh, Zap is pretty awesome and because this is an OWASP conference and because that's a fully, you know, Again, the plugins are free, but the Zap is also free, so you can take this home and, and uh, take a look at this stuff. And so that was the question that we had: is like, hey, if we have this attack surface data, what you know, what can we do with that? And what that lets us do is you know, some really interesting stuff because we can identify situations, or we can identify things that you wouldn't see during the normal course of the crawl. Uh, you know, as these dynamic scanning tools try to crawl the application to guess or to determine the attack surface, there are a number of scenarios that you can run into where you don't, where the, where the scanner's not going to see everything. Um, and especially when you're looking at situations, if you're doing testing of a mobile application and looking at the REST services of the back end, it can be really challenging to get a full picture of what are all the different methods that this API is exposing. Uh, you know, same thing if you have like single page web applications that are talking mostly over uh, you know, REST endpoints. The different scanners have varying levels of quality or capability in determining this. Um, so. Uh, just again, uh, some, some quick final thoughts about this. Um, I, I, in, my, in my humble and unbiased opinion, I think this is a great use of that program with the DHS folks um, because we figured out what we originally wanted to figure out, but we're also able to do some uh, additional interesting stuff. Um, so to get the plugins, there's a, a couple different ways. I've got some links. I've got links. I will add links to these slides. I think add links to slides. Um, where you can download these plugins uh, and, and a command line tool directly, um, or you can just pull uh, if you oops there we go, uh, and you can just pull the code off of GitHub and uh, and, and and pull it out or, or running like when you build the Threadfix server, there's a page that you can go to on the Threadfix server and download the plugin. So like during the build process, it builds the plugins and then stuffs them in the WAR file that runs the server. Uh, so that you can download them directly from there. And I can show you what that looks like. There we go. There we go. Yeah, and so it's just a page here where you can go to download tools, and then it has the yeah, all these various tools in there. So uh, you can pull those and get access to those. <clears throat> uh, and uh, again, you install it just like you would any other Zap plugin. It, there's a .zap file. Um, and we've got a instructions on the wiki page and you basically import it. And like I said, we, we also have similar plugins for Burp Suite and we've got one for AppScan that should be available soon. Uh, and all the plugins essentially work in, you know, do, do the same, you know, have the same basic capabilities. So I want to talk about three different things that we've found that we can do with this technology. And the first is attack surface enumeration. Second is identifying potential backdoors and uh, also helping you to do some auditing of configuration settings. And the idea here is, uh, you know, and kind of philosophically the way I look at it, anything that can be automated, I love automation, right? If you, you know, the more automation you can include, that is going to do nothing but help. Uh, you know, again, uh, I, I think everybody here probably knows if you look at the count of developers versus the count of app security people, uh, app security people are horribly outnumbered. Uh, like the Battle of Thermopylae movie 300 outnumbered, right? It's just, uh, you know, so you have to have as much, or, you know, wherever you have opportunities to use automation, that is tremendously helpful. There are also things that have to be done manually. Um, and so in cases like that, we want to use automation to help support that, uh, those, those manual activities. And so, uh, you know, again, we'll, we'll talk about a combination of things that are either fully automated um, or situations where you, uh, you know, where you can uh, you know, get a be, become more efficient by using these types of uh, these types of things. So for the attack surface enumeration, what we want to do is take this data structure we've developed and enumerate all of the URLs that the application will respond to. Right? We want to know every place that someone can reach out and touch this application, and that starts by knowing all of the URLs that that application will respond to. Uh, we also want to know 
what are the parameters that we can pass in that will potentially change the behavior of the application. So again, we want to know if a bad guy or if an adversary is looking at the application, what is everything that they could possibly go in and touch? Because ideally, that's going to be the scope of what we do security testing for. We need, if we know the attack surface, uh, then, we, you know, then, then we can at least uh, you know, have some level of confidence in the level of coverage that we have from our testing. You know, so why is this a problem? Um, you know, again, all these dynamic scanners, they, uh, you know, they're built to crawl. You know, give it the first page, it finds the second. Some of them are doing better things with JavaScript proxying, you know, watching traffic in the background. You know, the challenge is that applications rarely work the way that you want them to. And this is especially the case as developers get more clever over time. You know, you find things, hidden landing pages that link into the application, but where the main navigation never links out to them. <clears throat> you know, we find a lot of situations where there's multi-step processes, like a shopping cart checkout, where the automation doesn't necessarily successfully crawl. They get to the first step in the process, submit some junk data, but it doesn't take them to the second set of the process. All right? <clears throat> or if there are different states that the web application could be in that will cause it to redirect it to different pages or to, uh, you know, uh, you know, to, to show evidence of certain parameters that it will listen to. <clears throat> Um, and you know, we'll also talk about you know, uh, you know, sometimes there's debug functionality and things of that nature. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And this is also, we found this to be very useful if you are looking at applications that make extensive use of REST APIs. And this is most common, uh, you know, these days it's most common, I think, for, um, uh, for mobile applications that are calling back into some sort of web service. Um, you know, it can also be uh, valuable for you know, single page web applications and, and things like that. And so, you know, these are situations where the current set of dynamic testing tools are not very good necessarily at that crawling process. And so you run the risk then of having false negatives. Um, and so if you're looking at testing, you have two bad situations that could come up. You have false positives, which are a, a serious problem with both dynamic and, uh, and, and static testing tools. And a false positive occurs where the tool flags a vulnerability but that vulnerability is not actually a true vulnerability. This is looking at the flip side of that problem, which is false negatives, which are there are vulnerabilities in the application, but our testing, for whatever reason, didn't identify those vulnerabilities. And so what we're trying to do here is make sure that we're penetration testing all of the application, that we know all of the endpoints that an attacker might find and try to exploit. <clears throat> because we want to see that coverage of the application. We want to see you know, strong coverage of the application so that we feel like the automated testing that we're doing is, you know, is, you know, is you know, covering sufficient, uh, sufficient ground. Uh, so we've taken this technology and stuffed it into a command line client. And so let's go. So we can run this against ThreadFix, which complains about the Git stuff. And so what we see here is, so basically what this did is this went and looked at, in this case, the ThreadFix source code, detected this is a Java and Spring application, went through and identified all of the classes that had controller annotations and said, because I understand how the Spring framework works, I know that these controller classes are going to take different methods and attach those to URLs to execute. It also, know, it also goes through and parses for all of the model annotations and builds the object graph of those different model objects in memory. Uh, and we'll talk more about that later. <clears throat> but in doing that, because it understands the framework, it can enumerate, again, here are all of the URLs that this application will respond to, as well as all the parameters that can be passed in to that. And so what we see here is, and like at the tail end, we're looking at a lot of the REST API, um, you know, where we see we can post to REST, WAFs. Um, it knows that, um, it knows when certain parameters are ID parameters, or when certain you know, paths, parts of a path are ID parameters, so it identified that there. 
uh, and also knows that you can pass in to this method a file and a uh, WAF ID. Uh, parsing parameters out like that is also helpful because a lot of times the dynamic scanners, when they do dynamic scanning, will over-report certain vulnerabilities. So if you have a RESTful style of URL creation, where, uh, like the pet clinic is a good example, you know, the Java pet clinic, where it'll say, you know, slash pet slash one slash something, slash pet slash two slash pet slash three. Well, if you have a SQL injection vulnerability, the crawler or the, the, the fuzzer is going to find that a number of times, and it's going to over-report that. When in actuality, what we know because we've analyzed the source code is all of those requests, you know, pet slash one, pet slash two, pet slash three, all of those will go and touch the same source code entry point. So if we actually know that, we can actually clean up the dynamic scan results and collapse those down and say, I know that this hits the same code, um, and therefore these X number of dynamic findings that we've found, we can roll that up into a, uh, you know, in, 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 into one finding. But it also lets us know, again, all the parameters that can be passed in. And so in this case, this, this can be really helpful because this is enumerating for us all of the REST APIs. And you know, HTML and the page structure of a, of a kind of more traditional web application, crawlers are okay at figuring that stuff out, but they're really bad at identifying REST endpoints. And so what this lets us know here is, hey, this thing has a whole REST API, and here is the set of methods and the set of parameters that we'll need to test uh, if we want to feel like we've got sufficient coverage. Uh, this is also great at identifying like old versions of APIs and things like that, you know, forgotten source code that the development team might not be maintaining, might not be actively testing, but that will still be exposed in a build. And so it's, uh, there's, I, I, I believe found a lot of value in being able to run a quick dump of the source code and to enumerate this type of stuff because from a manual standpoint, this shows you a lot of stuff that you might not otherwise know, and it can identify potentially interesting things that you can go and test. Um, you know, and from an automation standpoint, when we plug this into a, uh, when we plug this into something like Zap, what we've done with the plugin is we can then go in and say, I want to import our endpoints from the source code. It, uh, this is an example of the budget store. We want to use that source code location. Co that corresponds to that dynamic location. What we see over here is we've preceded the spidering process with a lot of information that it would not have had otherwise. And so we are finding things like this page, admin.jsp, that you wouldn't find, if you just did an unauthenticated crawl, you wouldn't necessarily find that admin.jsp page because there would never be a link in the HTML to that page. But because we have foreknowledge of the application's attack surface, we can precede it and, th and, and, and therefore test that. And if I'm manually testing, I'm probably gonna go and see if I can access admin.jsp if I haven't logged in. Uh, that's uh, you know, not an unheard of uh, mistake for people to make. Uh, and it also lets us know that that page is going to be subject to the dynamic. If we do an automated scan of this, then that page will be included in the scope of the fuzzing that is being performed. Uh, any questions about that? And so again, this is going to identify if you have multi-step workflows, if you have landing pages, uh, you know, all these things that a traditional scanner and its spidering process might not find, that is going to be available both for, you know, as you're manually testing and creating your checklist of things that you want to, you want to take a look at, but also making sure that that is in scope for the dynamic testing or the dynamic automated fuzzing that's being done. Again, the goal being here to hopefully reduce, uh, reduce or eliminate false positives. And that's not the thing. Um, mm -hmm. What other technology do you support? Uh, so right now it's Java with, oh sorry, repeating the question, right. Uh, so what, what technologies are supported right now? Um, there's Java with support for JSP, Spring, and Struts. Uh, there's C Sharp for ASP.NET Web Forms and ASP.NET MVC. There's Ruby uh, with Ruby on Rails, and we have some initial support for PHP. Um, the PHP support is, like, supports very well a situation where your PHP file layout matches very closely to your URL layout, but if you're using, like, WordPress or another PHP framework, then it's gonna be confused by that. Um, so, uh, and then I think we're, 
looking to add you know, Python, Django, and some JavaScript, server-side JavaScript support are kind of the things that we're looking at. Uh, and the nice thing about this is, if you look at our Spring support, it's maybe one or 2,000 lines of code, which is, which is not no code, but is also, uh, like to add support for new languages and frameworks, especially given the existing ones, you can kind of incrementally build up a more and more capable endpoint database generator. Um, so if you have a custom framework or if something's not supported, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not unreasonable to think that somebody might sit down and put together a parser to, to, to start getting some of that inside, so. Uh, yes? Uh, you're asking about Android applications? Right, right, so right now this is only working with web applications. Um, we're trying to work on a, or we're, we're, we're hoping to land a contract soon to extend that to also look at mobile applications and potentially other types of applications because yeah, I think there are uh, valuable, uh, there, I think there's value in being able to enumerate, to look at an Android application or an iOS application and say from a attack surface standpoint, this thing uses these two SQLite databases and this thing, you know, and, and, and these files over here as well as making these outbound network calls. And so that's kind of the direction that we're looking to go with it uh, in the future. Excellent. Um, so, what you can also do is potentially identify, like as you look at these things, what you can potentially do is identify suspicious parameters that may be an indicator of some sort of a backdoor. And a great example here, if you look at the budget store, is there's a number of situations where you can pass in parameters called debug. Again, that's probably something you're never going to see during the HTML crawl, but it's very interesting to see that that exists. Uh, I did some work on a cold fusion application a number of years ago where if you passed a parameter named D in, whatever value you had for the parameter D, let's say I passed in D equals 1000, it would go and find order 1000 and delete it. Sure, why not, right? And, and this was most likely a function that a developer had put into the code as a convenience thing for them so that they didn't have to log into the admin screen as they were doing development. But because this is cold fusion, that got cut and pasted into every page in the application, because why not? Uh, you know, and in addition to that, <laughs> you know, that also then got deployed to production. And so you know, I wouldn't think, as a blind pen tester, I wouldn't necessarily think to pass in a parameter D, but by dumping out that application's attack surface, you could look at that and say, well, what does this parameter do? Let me fuzz that or send some, you know, uh, you know, send some, uh, some requests in that manipulate that. And then you know, maybe, maybe let's also go and look at the source codes so that we can find out why that stuff is there. And so you can potentially, again, by being able to quickly get some understanding of the application, how it's going to run, uh, that can provide value both to the automated testing as well as in this case to manually looking and saying that debug parameter, you know, what is that doing? Uh, you know, let, let, me, let me include that in the scope of my testing. What you can also do by looking at the source code is look for potential MVC misconfiguration. So a lot of the MVC frameworks have uh, auto binding, where they'll take the parameters that you pass in, you know, according to some uh, you know, sequence, you know, something dot something dot something, and it will stitch those to the object tree you know, that's, that's running on the server side associated with a given session. And that's great from a convenience standpoint, but can also lead to a number of issues. And Dennis Cruz has done a lot of uh, you know, publication about this, other folks, uh, about these types of issues. <clears throat> and so um, by looking at an application's configuration and by the, you know, the parsing in the case of Spring, the looking at the model, uh, you know, at the, you know, the class dev model annotations and the properties associated there, what we're able to do is we're able to see, at, you know, hey, for this given request, what are all the parameters that might be accepted? And that can help us identify potential issues on the server side. And so a great example of that is if we go up here, let's say we go to pet store. <clears throat> you know, here what we see is we, uh, if you go and you look, you can identify the situations where you've got things like pet.birthdate, uh, you know, or you find longer ones here, owner.id.owner.pet.owner.firstname, right? And so we can identify, if I'm looking at that and saying, do I really want this URL to let me set things that far down in the object tree? And the answer may be yes, there's a good reason for that, or the answer may be no, there's not a great reason for that, and that's something that, uh, you know, that, that deserves further, further scrutiny. <clears throat> um, so 
just kind of in, in closing, I think we have a, a minute for questions after this before we roll over to the next talk. Um, but look, a couple different things. You know, the idea is, you know, how can we use source code and source code analysis to help improve the quality of our dynamic testing, both improve the speed at which we can do it, as well as improve the coverage that we have. Um, again, this is something where I think that we've, uh, I, I think there's some interesting things that we've got that we can find right now, but there's other stuff that we can do as well. Um, you know, I think there's, you know, we've started to introduce the concepts of authentication and authorization, so that gets to be very interesting. Show me all the URLs that an unauthenticated user can access versus an authenticated user. You know, if I have a set of static results, that may cause me to say, well, if I've got a thousand cross-site scriptings, first I want to look at the 100 that you can access from an unauthenticated user. Um, so that's, we've started to introduce those concepts as well. Uh, and I think given the, uh, you know, give, given the parsing that we're doing, you know, it, it, you know, to your question about Android, you know, the things that we're doing to identify calls to uh, you know, certain method calls and things like that, those can be extended to look for additional method calls. Uh, and from that, we can do things like, hey, for this Android source code, show me whether or not it uses SQLite databases or files. So you can start to do some automation of threat model creation so you can understand here are the different things that this application touches. Um, so then I'll open it up for, uh, for, for if anybody has a, a question. And I'll be around you know, later today and tomorrow. So. Yes? Um, so are you asking about uh, data flow analysis? Right, right. Yeah, and so, uh, so the question is, do, are we doing any like, cross-function data flow analysis? No, no, we're not. And if you saw how, like when we ran against the thread fix source code, which is 100,000 lines of code or something, like it ran like that, that we're, not, like, we're not trying to repl replace a, a, a commercial-grade static analysis engine. Um, and, and, and so we're not doing that kind of like cross-method, any of that stuff. I, we do a little bit of in, you know, like intra-method data flow analysis uh, to identify some stuff. But really, uh, that, that's, a, that's a different problem that I think those engines are solving. And it, it, we're, we're really doing you know, essentially kind of like a very, very close scope of semantic analysis. Um, you know, again, like using what we've built, could you uh, extend that to start to do more data flow analysis? Uh, you know, potentially, yes. But again, our mission was less to, we, we didn't set out to create a freely available like commercial grade static analysis engine. Instead, we were trying to solve a, a different problem, which was like, how can, I, how can I correlate the results of these commercial grade static and dynamic analysis engines? Um, so. Uh, yeah, so what do we look for in you know, roots or functions? Um, it depends on the language and the framework, but uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot, for certain things, there's a lot of semantic analysis looking for calls to things like get parameter, get headers, and things of that nature. Also, parsing out, uh, you know, and, and I'm not a Ruby person, but like parsing out like the way that Ruby identifies parameters being identified, as well as doing things like parsing out Java annotations to look for, and like Java Spring looking for controller and model and things of that nature. So it's a pretty fast, uh, you know, tokenizing, we basically, it's a you know, tokenizing parser, and then we just attach a couple of handlers to it. And so that's why it's, it's super fast, um, because it lets us quickly identify those, and we've got little state machines that we run for that stuff. Um, but we, uh, but again, it's not doing that kind of like full data flow analysis where you, uh, you know, where it's, you know, cr cross method and things like that, so. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Anything else? We, we great? Yes. Oh, right, right. Um, I, 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 not running here, but uh, yeah, in, in, and I forget the version number, but in earlier versions of SonarCube, each finding had to be associated with a file and a line of code, and so that made it like hard or impossible, or you would have to really uh, you know, do something weird to make SonarCube work with dynamic scan results. Um, what, we, what we figured out is because we have that, you know, given dynamic results and the endpoint database, we could map that back. So that let us map, we've got a Sonar Cube plugin as well that lets you take the results of dynamic testing and map those back to lines of code. I, 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 one caveat is I think newer versions of Sonar Cube have relaxed or changed the requirement to, to have to have a specific file and line of code mapping for each finding that they're tracking. 
So that may, we may have solved the problem that lived for like a week after we did it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but in any case, you know, given that capability of taking a dynamic result, mapping it to a line of source code, another use we found for that was to map dynamic findings into Sonar Cube. Excellent. And that's uh, all. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you.